I'm currently sitting underneath the Palmetto Bay Village Center, overlooking its lagoon. It's a 300,000 square foot office building that houses some of the city's municipal offices, as well as some corporate offices as well. It's truly a sprawling complex with ballrooms for events, a separate kitchen facility, the aforementioned lagoon, and apparently a very highly well-regarded disc golf course. But this wasn't always the Palmetto Bay Village Center, and the view wasn't always so nice. This building was actually built to house the headquarters of Burger King, a business best known for its expansion out of Miami. The on-site kitchens were meant to be test kitchens, the ballrooms meant for Burger King corporate events, and the view appropriate for one of America's best-known brands. The building was inaugurated in 1988, but four years later, on August 24, 1992, Hurricane Andrew would hit. It would make landfall about seven miles south of here. The storm would bring 16 feet of water onto the complex. If I was sitting right here on that day, I'd be under 10 feet of water and long dead. The lagoon and the small bank of trees in front of me that separates the complex from Biscayne Bay are meant to act as a buffer from storm surge, but there's only so much you can do with a Category 5. Burger King eventually picked a safer location near Miami International Airport. This building was abandoned and purchased by the city, becoming the complex it is today. But you may be wondering, if that storm made landfall in August, why are we talking about it today, September 18th? That's because we're not talking about Andrew. We're going to talk about another storm that shook Miami to its core. A storm whose eye passed directly over my head making landfall at this very spot. That storm is the Great Miami Hurricane of 1926, and it made landfall here, today. This day in Miami history, September 18th, 1926, when the Great Miami Hurricane blew ashore and changed Miami forever. The high times and low times All in the nightlife It's not really much of a surprise that Miami is significantly impacted by tropical weather. While Miami is approximately 160 miles north of the Tropic of Cancer, it has the Gulf of Mexico located to its west. That bathtub warm body of water feeds both the Florida Straits and the Gulf Stream Current, all three perfect fuel for tropical storms. The Hurricane Research Division of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration finds that the earliest record of a hurricane somewhere near Miami actually took place on October 29, 1769. The ship Leadbury was pushed ashore, reporting hurricane force winds around the southeastern region of the Florida Peninsula. Since the National Hurricane Center began maintaining more accurate records in the 1880s, Miami-Dade County was impacted at least six times by storms. 1888, although legendary meteorologist Brian Norcross may disagree with the landfall location of that hurricane, the National Hurricane Center says it is a Miami Beach storm. Norcross argues it actually landed closer to Fort Lauderdale. But in 1891, 1904, 1906, and again in 1906, and in 1924, hurricanes directly or indirectly impacted Miami-Dade County. But nothing like the Great Miami Hurricane of 1926. 1926 was an incredibly eventful year for Miami. Obviously by September, things went sideways. But it really started out as a year of unlimited possibility. The Miami Tribune, published on January 1st, 1926, reads like a dream. The city's Chamber of Commerce reports its best year ever. The city's post office says it's grown faster than any post office in the history of the United States. 
the regents of the soon-to-be-open University of Miami accept a $1 million donation from Coral Gable resident Victor Hope. And in sports, the four horsemen of Notre Dame will take the field one last time, two years after they graduated from South Bend, to take on players from the 1922 Princeton Tigers squad, marking arguably the first all-star game in American football. The host of that game? The place that will draw the attention of virtually every sports fan in America? Of course, Coral Gables. For the average Miamian, it has to start to feel like the law of gravity itself ceases to apply along Miami shore. The song you're hearing is actually entitled Along Miami Shore. It was written by Harry Warren, Walter Hirsch, and Abe Ullman in 1926. Forgive the Hawaiian-sounding steel guitar, but it certainly does put you in a place in time. On that New Year's Day, 1926, it had to seem like the boom time of the 1920s was never going to end for the Magic City. But the harbinger of things to come would arrive within two weeks. On January 10th of 1926, the Prinz Valdemar, a 241-foot steel-hulled schooner, sinks in the middle of Miami Harbor, making it nearly impossible for materials to enter through the port. This is bad for living conditions, but this is terrible for real estate growth. We'll talk much more about the Prince Valdemar at a later date, but know that this is the first domino to fall in the collapse of the Miami boom, and some say a key component in what will become the Great Depression. So if Miami was swaggering in January 1926, it was staggering by September 1926. The university was still planned to open in October, But real estate prices were stagnant, if not falling, and the economy that had propped up the city's growth for two decades was beginning to look questionable. On about September 11, ships in the Atlantic report a relatively strong tropical wave, with winds around 60 miles an hour. This report, generated from approximately 46 degrees north, 42 degrees west, was certainly nothing to write home about. We know this because... The National Weather Service didn't write anything about it to give anyone any information in South Florida. Its track kept it largely away from land, which made it even more difficult to get a gauge on how the storm would develop. It wasn't until noon on Friday, September 17th, that the Centralized Weather Bureau in Washington, D.C. directed the Miami office to post a storm warning, what we would now call a tropical storm warning. It wasn't until 6 p.m. that warnings about hurricanes were finally shared. The storm would make landfall approximately 12 hours later, as a strong Category 4 hurricane with maximum sustained winds of approximately 145 miles an hour. No matter the circumstance, Anytime that kind of storm is coming ashore, there's going to be untold property damage and terribly unfortunate loss of life. But there is a particularly cruel twist that made the great Miami hurricane of 1926 extra deadly. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, the landfall is estimated to have occurred right around Palmetto Bay, but the eye was discernible all the way to downtown and Miami Beach. And remember, there had not been a major hurricane like this in the modern history of the city of Miami. And so residents didn't know what to do. At landfall, when the peaceful eye of the hurricane was swirling around them, they thought the storm was over. They took to the streets. They took to the causeways. They wanted to see the damage that was done. What they didn't anticipate was that the very worst of the storm would be arriving in mere minutes. The back end of the eye wall, ready to smash Miami and kill hundreds.
Richard Gray, the director of the Miami Weather Bureau office, is quite a hero in all this. He was actually the founding officer of this office and worked extraordinarily hard on the 17th and 18th to inform as many Miamians as possible about the threat of the storm, going above and beyond what the National Weather Bureau required. In addition, he went to extreme measures in the middle of a Category 4 hurricane to try to convince Miamians to return to their homes. This is from his monthly meteorological report issued by the Weather Bureau. There was an abrupt decrease in wind velocity between 6.10 a.m. and 6.15 a.m. when the center of the storm reached Miami. Many persons who had spent the night in downtown buildings rushed out to view the wreckage that filled the streets. I warned those in the vicinity of the Federal Building, the headquarters of the Miami Weather Bureau office, that the storm was not over and that it would be dangerous to remain in the open. The lull lasted 35 minutes, and during that time the streets of the city became crowded with people. As a result, many lives were lost during the second phase of the storm. The official death count associated with this hurricane was 372. However, it's believed that the total number of deaths might be in the 500s, or potentially even more. Tens of thousands of Miamians were left homeless. Methods of communication and transportation out of South Florida were destroyed. It's hard to really imagine how awful it must have been. Living in Miami, we're familiar with hurricanes. But even with Hurricane Andrew, there were days to prepare and anticipate. This storm, literally and figuratively, dropped out of the sky. The morning edition of the Miami Herald on September 18th put to bed the night before, barely reflected the reality on the ground in the city of Miami. Again, such a strong storm hadn't been considered less than 24 hours before. A single column on the left-hand side of page one, titled, Storm's Edge Brings Strong Wind to Miami, Ships Here Safe, reflects a total lack of awareness of what this great hurricane would do. There would be no Miami Herald published on September 19th, 1926. The Miami Daily News would manage to publish a Day of Hurricane edition. The massive headline sprawled across the entire page, Hurricane Hits Miami. That would be the only page that they printed that day. I don't know about you, but I find something very unsettling about looking in an archive and seeing a one-page newspaper edition. Reading reporting about the hurricane is one thing, but being able to actually hear from survivors is another. And luckily, we have a few testimonies from survivors of the Great Miami Hurricane. Jane Wood was 13 years old when the Great Miami Hurricane hit, and she was one of the Miamians who ventured outside into the eye. Her recollections reflect someone that was excited by the unknown, but facing mortal danger. Well, my mother waked me up that morning, uh, rather early, and said, wake up, Jane, there's been a terrible hurricane. And I got up and said, why didn't you wake me up? And looked outside, and it was perfectly clear, absolutely calm, but Miami Beach uh, was under about 30 inches of water. Ooh, I was thrilled silly. And my mother and my uncle and I put on our bathing suits and decided to walk down uh, to see how Brad's gal, a friend, had fared. And it was about three or four blocks away on Michigan Avenue. And uh, little did we know it was the eye of the storm. And we got down there, and about the time we got down there, the second half hit. Bang! You know, and my uncle and I decided to walk home, and mother decided to stay there with Blanche in their apartment she was in. And my uncle and I held hands, looked at each other, and grinned on the way, and leaned against the wind. And I fell in love with Miami that day. There's something in the heart of every 13 year old that loves strength and vandalism. Jane Wood truly one of the pioneers of Miami. 
experienced the hurricane just one year after moving with her family from Macon, Georgia. As you heard, she credits the storm with developing her love of Miami. She would eventually go on to raise peacocks in her Kendall home, wrestle alligators, walk hundreds of miles on South Florida's beaches, marry Miami Herald reporter Harry Reno, and raise their daughter Janet Reno to eventually become the first female attorney general in the history of the United States. The second recollection we have is from Anna Bruger Meredith, who was based 60 miles away from Janet Wood in Boynton Beach, a far distance when talking about tropical storms. But in her recollection, recorded through the Boynton Beach Oral History Project, thanks to an interview conducted by James Nichols, we can hear the difficulty that residents, even up in Palm Beach County, had with this storm. Some of us walked and some of us, older people went in car. I know we walked mm -hmm. and went to the Seaboard Railroad Company mm -hmm. and stayed out there. And they moved, the, they had a volunteer fire department at the time, and they moved the fire truck out there, you know, for mm -hmm. emergency sake. And people were praying. The Catholics were reading the beads, and I, it's a night that I never will forget, I'll tell you that. Out of the station. And then after dark, the wind began to blow, and it came from the other way and took all the water away again. Mm. And it was daylight, though, mm -hmm. near daylight, when the storm uh, let down again. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Charles Sr. was the fire chief, mm -hmm. and he to got all the boys. My husband was a, f a volunteer fireman, and mm -hmm. all the other ones that were out there, and they got on the truck to drive around town to see the damage to come back to tell us about it. Again, it's really important to remember the fact that this storm made landfall near Palmetto Bay. That's a nearly 75-mile distance between the point of landfall and the impact you just heard described. This was a massive storm in strength, and in size. Well, we've covered Miami-Dade, and we went up to Palm Beach, so it's only fair we stop back in Broward and talk about one more individual impacted by this storm. Leona Woods Newton was interviewed on November 20th, 2001, and asked about her recollections of Broward County history through the Broward County Library's Kitty Oliver Oral History Race and Change Project. And she shares what may be one of the most horrifying experiences one can imagine in one of the most jovial and uplifting ways possible. But they was living there, and I think it took a little off of their house, done some damage over there, because you could see the top swelling in the air. Mm. And it comes straight on across the us, right on the corner, took the whole house down. Ooh. It was part in it, you know, they had on this side, but Mama and them had the whole thing took the whole plantation down because we, when the water started to rise, that's when we went to the school. It was about like that, but the water was up to here. The water was up to the My neck. neck. Oh. To my neck. Because I guess that's a low area right in there. Mm. And uh, we went to the school and we stayed there when the storm was over with. We went back. We didn't have nothing but the wooden stone. But the the wooden stove sitting, sitting on the platform. No clothes, no nothing. That was that bad storm. Leona was about seven years old when the hurricane hit. Imagine being a seven-year-old, wading through neck-high water, seeking refuge at a public school, and returning home to nothing. I guess it's better to laugh than to cry. Why is it important to hear these stories? Why is it important to remember these storms? Of course, as students of history, that's obvious. Of course, as students of history, that's obvious. But there's an even more important lesson to take away from studying storms like the Great Miami Hurricane of 1926. And who better to explain it than Ralph Rennick? Rennick, the news director of WTVJ Channel 4 in Miami, for decades, was the voice of news in South Florida. And as part of the station's coverage of the opening of hurricane season in 1984, he delivered this editorial, connecting 1926 
1984, and honestly, to today and beyond. Sixty years ago, Miamians didn't know much about hurricanes. There wasn't a sophisticated advance warning system then. The town paid the price. 114 people killed, 25,000 homeless, with $50 million damage. Lake Okeechobee overflowed, drowning 300 people and causing 165 million in damages. The force of the flood surge carried large boats inland, leaving them high and dry. Could the same thing happen again? Absolutely. But boats are expendable, people are not. 85% of South Floridians have not been through a major hurricane. August and September are the most dangerous months. But it's not too early to map out your own survival plans, evacuation, home and family protection, putting your boat in safe haven. Lessons can be learned from 1926, and they may be worth your life. According to census estimates, approximately 36% of Miami-Dade County is under the age of 30. That means they have absolutely no working knowledge of the last major hurricane that made direct landfall in the county, even if they were alive for it, and even if they were actually in Miami-Dade County. Now we know for a fact not everyone in that group was here, and we also know for a fact that a significant percentage of people over the age of 30 who live here now were not in Miami-Dade County for Andrew, including yours truly. While we have had direct landfalls from hurricanes since 1992, including Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and we've had close calls with major hurricanes, like Irma in 2017, we have not had this experience for almost 30 years. The only ability we have to prepare adequately is to do our research, is to understand what these storms can do, is to learn more about Andrew and the Great Miami Hurricane of 1926. It's not just about education. It's about self-preservation. Well, that'll do it for our show this week. It does run a little bit longer than normal, but I do love hurricanes. So thank you in advance for granting me the indulgence. As a University of Miami alumnus, the storm that gave the school its nickname was always going to get a little bit more tender love and care when it came up. I do want to thank a couple of very important sources of information in my preparation for this episode. First off, thanks as always for the work done by the National Hurricane Center. Uh, it's a remarkable source of information, not only for emergency preparation, but for very detailed analysis of historical patterns of weather. It would be impossible to have done this episode and determine where that storm made landfall without what the National Hurricane Center does. Second, I want to shout out local libraries. Three very important libraries uh, have really remarkable troves of information. I've mentioned the Wolfson Archives before. They are part of the Miami-Dade College library system. If you want to see any old clip of news about Miami, it's probably going to be found there. Secondly, two public library collections, one through the city of Boynton Beach, as part of their city's oral history project. And secondly, as I mentioned in the course of the episode, uh, the Broward County Public Library's Kitty Oliver Oral History Race and Change Project. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to hear from those survivors of the 1926 storm without those three repositories. And there's nothing better than hearing people in their own words. So thank you to all of the folks who help make those libraries run and can provide this incredibly important information to our community. I want to thank the folks at the Internet Archive, archive.org, for pointing me in the right direction, both for the information related to the interviews that were collected by our local libraries and for the information about Along Miami Shore, the song you heard earlier in the episode. Speaking of songs, I want to thank King Elizabeth for their track, Miami Sunrise, an excerpt of which you hear at the beginning and end of the episode. Be sure to check them out. Uh, they make some really good music. Lastly, I want to thank you, the listener. Uh, I got a really nice message from a follower on Twitter, JP, um, with uh, some really nice encouragement as well as uh, some pretty good ideas for future episodes. Um, I can confirm that a couple of those ideas are already lined up. A couple of more uh, are now tickling my interest. So uh, thank you for that. And for everyone else who's listening, please do check us out on social media at This Day Miami Pod 
or at thisdaymiamipod.com, which you can now begin to access transcripts from earlier episodes. I hope to, in the next month or so, get every episode transcribed and uploaded on the website so it's more accessible and more versatile as a source of history. As always, I will ask you one favor, and that is if you like the show, leave it a positive review on your preferred podcast platform, whether that's Google, Spotify, Amazon, or the preferred podcast platform for many, Apple Podcasts. Five-star reviews are fantastic. It's really good for our metrics. It helps more people discover this day in Miami history, and it makes me feel good. If you haven't already done so, please make sure you've developed an emergency response plan, especially tailored to responding to hurricanes that may threaten South Florida. Uh, If there is one lesson to take away from this episode, it is that. Make sure you know how they work and make sure you know how you should respond should a major hurricane start bearing down on the Magic City. So until next time, thank you so much for listening. And I've been Matthew Bunch. The high